Becky, that's a beautiful, beautiful song. Heaven died, there are no losers. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that good to know today that God can take every one of us, any one of us, and use us? In fact, He often specializes in using the least of these. Uh, and, and that's some of what we're going to talk about this morning. Just a, a couple of things before I get into that. Uh, Chad, let me know there are a couple of the Body Christ books right up here. Um, if you are, going, if you for some reason not been a small group or you haven't been to your small group and didn't get yours, those will have those available to you. Um, and uh, also, uh, we, if you need direction to a Sunday school class or a small group that would work with you, I know that Chad, that is uh, really kind of his part of his capacity, and he would he would love to talk with you about that. I would talk with you about that. We also have a a little uh, display back here in the hallway through that window you can see right there there's a display that has some information about some of those classes that you can be a part of and, uh, and I just want to also mention uh, I know several of you have been asking and uh, we just appreciate your prayers for our family this week as well uh, I know we've had several deaths not only in our immediate church family but in our extended church family and many of you know that our daughter Emily we had an episode, I don't know what else to call it, on, on a Thursday. We thought she was having a stroke. Um, and it was a pretty scary thing, I'll just tell you. Um, she's doing better. She can't walk. And we don't, they don't exactly know why. Uh, they have some ideas, but all of those things are kind of unprovable at this point. She's had great medical care. And, we appreciate that so much, but she's probably going today to rehab, and they anticipate she'll be able to regain that in a few days or with a period of time, gain the strength back in her legs. And uh, we just thank you so much for your prayers and your concern uh, for us. Uh, if, you're not from, if you don't know, Emma's carrying twins, and the babies are fine. Uh, so uh, but, uh, and we trust Emma's going to be as well. All right, turn with me in the book of Esther, please. And uh, we're to, now I'm not going to do the John 15 today. I'll start in that next week as we kind of officially launch that next week. But on this Labor Day weekend, I want us to think uh, kind of along the lines of what Becky, uh, the song Becky played. There are no losers in heaven's eyes. There are, uh, there, there are people who God gives the capacity to have influence and ability regardless of our life situation. And uh, we, we like to say around here that we are all ministers and missionaries, every one of us. Uh, we don't have a, a, a hierarchy or a class of people that we call ministers or a class of people we call missionaries. All of us missionaries, all of us ministers, all of us have the capacity to influence others for Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that today, and I hope that kind of comes alive for you today as we delve into the book of Esther. And, uh, and, and by the way, Ted, Ted told me that the reason there's such a, a gap here is that I was left here this week believing and trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to do something amazing, and we want to give him room. All right? So that's the, that's the point of that. All right. The, the story of Esther, great story. If you've never read it, take time to do that. It is uh, an amazing uh, little book in the, in the Old Testament. And, and it comes at a time when the Jews were... Uh, had been taken out of their homeland, had been taken into exile uh, about 70 years before the book of Esther takes place, all this takes place. Uh, they were taken by the Babylonians into exile. And uh, they, that was the time of Daniel. If you read the book of Daniel, you get a picture of that. Also the book of Ezekiel, the book of Isaiah sort of crosses over into that. The book of Jeremiah, those kind of, some of those uh, Old, Old Testament prophetic books. And, and so, uh, but, but now about 70 years later, the Jews are, the, the Babylonians who overtook the Jews were taken over themselves by the Persians, by the Persian Empire. And the Persians uh, believed that, that the Jews should be allowed to go back home, that people should be allowed to practice their religion, so to speak, as they saw fit, that this added to peace and goodwill in the, in, in the nation. And so they allowed the Jews to go back home. And many of them did, but many of them didn't. And Esther is among those who did not go back to her homeland. And she was a young Jewish 
girl, uh, of no real import, if, if you would say, uh, no, not on anybody's map as far as, as having some position among the Jews. She was a, a woman, a young woman, and her lineage, we don't know anything special about that except that she was a Jew. And, and Esther, but Esther came at a time, uh, came forward at a time uh, that was very opportune. God used her, as we're going to see, in an amazing way. She, uh, actually, what, what happened was Xerxes, the king of Persia, uh, had a wife by the name of Vashti. And Vashti was kind of a, a feminist before her time. And in a good way, I think. She stood up against the king when he was trying to uh, take advantage of her in ways that she did not want to be taken advantage of. And so she stood her ground in a time when women weren't really given a right to stand their ground. And when she did, he deposed her from the queenship and went on a hunt for a queen, sort of like a Persian version of The Bachelor. Okay? Now, I've never watched The Bachelor. I'm not that bored. But I understand that there probably are some people out here, and you, you need a, a lot. No, I'm just kidding. But, but uh, the, 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 sort of like the, the Bachelor, where, you know, there's this, and, and it was really kind of a sordid thing. It was kind of a sordid thing. He chose among all these women, and the one who was most desirable in beauty and and, 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 and other ways, he, he, he chose that person as his queen, and Esther was, was chosen as the queen of Persia. And she steps into this role, and she just kind of merges into the culture around her. She sort of loses touch with her Jewishness, if you will, her people of Godness, and, and, and she gets kind of caught up in the whole palace thing, and, and you can imagine that would be a pretty heady thing for a young woman. And, uh, and, and there she is in this position. And um, through some compromises, rises up into this position as queen. And, and there, in the story also, there is a man by the name of Mordecai. Mordecai was Esther's uncle. Esther happened to be an orphan. Her, both her parents died. And in, that, in the Jewish world, the uncle was responsible to take his, the uh, daughter of his brother and be her guardian, raise her up. And so Mordecai essentially became her guardian. He was her uncle. He became her guardian. And Mordecai is also a very important person in this whole story. And there's also another guy by the name of Haman. Uh, in fact, we, I, I've been told that Marcus Reed, when he, when he walked us through the uh, uh, Passover meal, some of you remember Marcus Reed walked us through the Passover meal a few years ago, said that uh, when the Jews celebrate this holiday that surrounds this whole story here, that when Haman's name is mentioned, the people hiss. Okay? They, they, they hiss as they're telling the story. So if I happen to say Haman, hiss. Okay? So let's practice. All right, like that. That's his, okay? All right. And, and Haman really was a, a, a bad man, and he, he kind of represents uh, the, 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 the enemy, the evil, in this whole story. And, and what took place was that uh, Haman considered himself, there you go, Haman considered himself to be a very important person, but the people around him not so much. And I kind of think of Haman as being a Barney Fife kind of person. All right? I don't know. He just, he wanted to be important, but, you know, he was sort of like the deputy mayor. Yeah, and, 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 and he wanted everybody to respect him, but nobody really respected him. Nobody really, yeah, and, and, uh, and least of all, Mordecai. Remember, Mordecai, the, the, the uncle of Esther. And Mordecai would disdain Haman and everything Haman stood for and would not bow down to him, even though Haman was a, a very important government official and had considered himself to be very important in the king's court, so to speak, and, but Mordecai would not bow down to him. Because of this kind of treatment and because of his sort of pathetic self-worth, sense of self-worth, I think, Haman decided that he would uh, not to get back at Mordecai and all the other Jews who did not respect him like he thought he should be respected. 
that he would make sure that there was an edict put forth that the Jews were an enemy to the Persian Empire and that the Jews should be eradicated from the culture around them. That in fact, they, there was an edict put out that there would be a certain day and a certain time when it was fair game to kill any of the Jews and plunder all their stuff. Now, can you imagine that? And, and this was the edict that was put forth. And Mordecai, of course, others knows what is happening here. And Mordecai, we find him grieving more in mourning because of what is happening in the midst of all of this. Now, I, I want you to, what I want you to see, the, the big picture of what I want you to see here today, is that God uses for His work in the world not just people inside believing communities, and not just preachers and missionaries, but also people out in the secular world, out in the public, out in the marketplace, people just like you. And, and, and what I want you to understand, you know, I look across this, I look across this room and, and I see a student, and I see uh, stay-at-home moms, and I see People who are in the working place, men and women who are in the working place in different types of jobs, different types of capacities. Uh, I see people in medical field. I see people and or teachers. I see people who are homeschooled and people who are in the public schools and people who are in private schools. And I see people, I mean, I, I, who are retired. I, I see, I, I mean, I don't know if I've left anybody out. Forgive me, but please. Fill in the blank with, with yourself and where you are and where your your life is right now, whatever that capacity may be for your life. It's probably different from what it was 10 years ago, maybe really different from what it was 20 years ago, if you're that old. And, and, and it, it, it probably is different now than it will be 10 or 20 years from now. But right now, where you are in the capacity that you are living right now, I want you to see your life as having influence. And every person has that, regardless of where, of, of where you are. We have the opportunity to influence people for the kingdom of God. We are ministers and missionaries in the world in which we live. Every one of us having the opportunity to influence someone else for Jesus Christ. Now, with that understanding, how do we live that out? How do we do that? How does that look in our life? And I think you're going to find some really amazing and practical things right here in this story that took place in about 500-something uh, B.C. All right? How do we live lives of influence for Christ's sake? And the big picture is this. Hear this call from God that He has put you where you are for His kingdom purposes. Now, you may not have ever thought of it that way. I mean, I, some of you on, on the, some of you in management, some of you on the, the factory line in some form or fashion, some of you, maybe a ditch digger, maybe a, I, I don't know what it may be, but you may never have thought of yourself as having this opportunity. But here, and I believe it's a call, you need to hear from God, not just from me, but from God, maybe through me, but from God, you need to hear this call from God that He has put you where He has put you for His kingdom purposes. When Jesus was asked, Lord, how do we pray? Teach us how to pray. Here's what He said. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, I want you to notice the order of things. And I don't think there's any mistake here in the order of things. Jesus taught us to pray first for the kingdom of God. Let His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before He taught, told us to pray for our daily bread. At one point, Jesus said this. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And, what, and the, point, the point is this, that, that if, if you can, listen, you can get, if you get your life so focused on, and it's easy to do this, to get our life so focused on making a living that we lose the sense of the life that God has called us to. 
And, and our, our jobs can become simply a way in which we just put food on the table, bread on the table, get a paycheck at the end of the week, and we live for the weekend. You know, the spirit is willing, but we live for the weekend. Say, you know, that, uh, that, that, that whole idea that, that life is all about just, that our work is all about just the, the end result, and the end result of that is nothing more, nothing less than a paycheck, making a living, putting bread on the table. Listen, God has called you to the place where you are, whether you are a stay at home mom and you have an opportunity to speak into the lives of your children, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a uh, uh, person in a management and supervisory role, whether you're kind of behind the scenes person working in a technical type situation. I don't, I don't know. Again, fill in the blank there. God has put you where you are for more purpose. And, and what we are called to do is seek first His kingdom. It's hard sometimes for us to, to understand this and to come to this understanding. That, that God is not just wanting to use men and women in ministry, but He's wanting to put every one of us in ministry and every one of us on the mission field. And when we begin to understand that, then our lives as we are people of the kingdom of God begin to take on greater, greater meaning than we ever imagined they would take on. In fact, eternal meaning. We seek first His kingdom his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. You know, one of the interesting things about the book of Esther is it comes right there in, in a kind of a cluster of three books. There's, uh, there, there's Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, right? Who was Ezra? He was a priest. He was a teacher of the law. He was given the responsibility to help the people in this time, in this time in history. And all three of these were contemporaries. And in this time in history, Ezra was given responsibility to equip the people, to reacquaint them with the Word of God and with what the Bible said about, what, about their lives and about how they were to live their lives. That was Ezra's responsibility. And then there was Nehemiah. What was Nehemiah's occupation? He started out as a cupbearer, right? The cupbearer was the cupbearer for the king, and that, that guy had the responsibility of drink, of test, testing the wine that they gave to the king before he drank it in case somebody poisoned it. Nice job, right? If you, you know, if you do your job, then sooner or later, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, that, that God took, took Nehemiah and, and, and out of his concern and out of his prayer life, Nehemiah had a heart for his people and had a heart for his homeland and he cried out to God and God moved him, essentially used him in management and in, as an engineer, essentially. It, Nehemiah became a builder of the wall of Jerusalem and managed the people and, and God increased his capacity in an amazing way. And then you have Esther, this young woman who kind of rises up out of nowhere and, and, and she was actually in politics by no choice of her own. She was in politics. She was in the palace and, 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 and had this opportunity to influence things from there. Now think about that. God using not just Ezra, the priest, but, but Nehemiah and Esther, and, and that, that kind of covers the, the gamut, right? Male, female, everybody having opportunity to influence, and each one of them needed in this time in history among his people. And you need to recognize that. <coughs> Please don't miss that. You're going to live out your life in, and, and you're going to sell yourself so short if you don't understand that God has called you to have influence, regardless of where you are right now in your life. And your life, yeah, you can live out your life and you can go through the motions of life, but you're not going to have the eternal, you're not going to have the joy and the experience the joy of having the eternal capacity to move life as God would have it to move, unless you understand what we're talking about right here today. Now, let's get into the story itself. And, and we, we read in, in chapter 4, verse 1, all these things have happened. This edict has been put out to annihilate the Jews from the land. And we read when Mordecai, remember that was Esther's uh, uncle, 
When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried out with a loud and bitter cry. And this was something that the Jews did, people did in that day when they were in mourning. There was something terrible that's happened. Put on sackcloth and pour ashes over their head. And he, he went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And, and by the way, the king's gate here is not the gate of the city. The, gate, the city was Susa, and it was the capital city of Persia. But in Susa, there was kind of a city in the city, and that was the king's courtyard, or the, 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 the palace courtyard, and this expanse of, of, of dwelling places. And, there was a, and it was about 120 feet up, higher than the rest of the city, and there was a gate that entered in there, and this is where Mordecai finds himself at this point, wailing and mourning in sackcloth and ashes. And in every province, wherever the king's command, this edict had been put out, this decree was reached, there, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Now, one of the interesting things about the book of Esther, and you know this, is that God is never talked about in this book. And prayer is never directly talked about in this book. But it does talk about the people fasting. I think there's a reason for that. I, I have my theory, but I don't have time to go into that today, but there's a reason for that. But, but here, the, the people are fasting, and I think we can add to that, praying, that the people are, are crying out to God, weeping and lamenting, many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Now, when Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, now remember, she's up in the palace, and she's sort of removed from everything, and she's sort of become absorbed in the palace life, and, and, and she, they came and told her she was deeply distressed. But look what she does. Look what she's distressed about. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth because he would not accept them. Now I think there's something here. I think there's something we don't want to miss here. What was she most concerned about? Changing the situation? She was concerned about appearance. She was concerned about what was on the surface. She was concerned about her uncle. Her uncle was an embarrassment to her at this point. He's wearing sackcloth and ashes, and she's you know, up here wearing the latest and the greatest, and, 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 and she just, she's been absorbed in the palace life. She's kind of been absorbed by the culture around her. And she's lost any sense of what really is going on here. She's totally detached from what's going on. Now, here's the point. Beware of the seduction of the marketplace. Beware of the seduction of the marketplace. Now, here's what I'm talking about. Because when we, as believers in Jesus Christ, are out in the marketplace every day, or we're in our schools, or we're in, you know, we're, we're whatever it is, whatever that capacity may be that I, we find ourselves in right now, it is easy for us to allow ourselves to get so wrapped up in the earning of a living, in the, in, in the being a part of the culture, and, and fitting in, and having the right appearances, that we lose sight of what is really, really going on, and what God is really doing. You see what happens? How, how easy it is for us to get seduced by the marketplace so that we lose any sense of the eternal going on there. But instead, the point becomes the marketplace itself and how high up we go and what we earn and what we bring home week and what we wear and what we drive and what we live in and all of those kinds of things. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with having a house, nothing wrong with having a car, nothing wrong with having nice clothes. Yeah, I, I recommend clothes. You know, I, I think those are good things. And, and all of, yeah, but, but here's the thing. The, those things can become, you see what's happening? Those things can become an end to themselves. In themselves. So that we lose sight of the in the midst of all of this. Esther's response, instead of being concerned about what ha is happening to her people, she's concerned about appearances. Over time, she has changed. She loses any sense of solidarity with what God is doing. 
in the middle of all of this. She's become increasingly desensitized to the need. And we can become out of touch and desensitized to the need around us. In fact, the more successful you are, I will say the more successful you are as a student, the more successful you are in the marketplace, the more seductive those things become as an end in themselves. And it's easier to have this sense of, you know, I, I need to rise up, I need to rise higher and higher, and in fact, we can get absorbed in those things. Interesting thing I was reading this week about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Some of you are familiar with that. You know, the rich man who went to hell, Lazarus went to heaven. And why Jesus gave the rich man, or Lazarus, a name in the story, and the rich man was just the rich man. The point is, because Lazarus, in coming to God, in being a believer, essentially, one who would go to heaven, was uh, did, found his identity in that, his identity, and he did not lose himself, but gained everything in the midst of all of that, given a name. But the rich man was just the rich man. The problem with being just a rich man is when you lose it, you lost you. The problem with everything being built around what you have, what you gain, who you are out there, is when you lose that, you lost you. You see, you, 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 either, you either find yourself in Christ or you lose yourself altogether, as we're going to see. What a sad thing to think about someone rising up like Esther. And as we're going to see, she has to be a challenge, has to be challenged so that she does not lose herself in the middle of all of this. You know, a man came to Jesus and said one day, and he said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And, and I, th I don't think Jesus is saying, don't have a house, don't have a car. Don't have... I think he's just saying, man, you get caught up in those things to the degree that so many people do, and you will lose who you are. Now, the, 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 we read on verse 5, Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Why is Mordecai in sackcloth and ashes? And Hathak, this messenger, went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. So Mordecai's got details here and wants everybody to know the details. Now, but, and I just want to say kind of parenthetically here, understand the purpose of our enemy. And we do have an enemy in this whole process who both wants to sideline us from our purpose, but also to trap others in their sin and in their darkness so that they will not see the, the hope of Jesus Christ. And essentially to uh, make it almost impossible for our influence uh, to, to take place in the, in, in the marketplace. That's his desire. He will not be content until every evidence of God is taken out of the marketplace. You know, we get upset when they take out nativity scenes. I, I saw, I've seen the last couple of weeks this story about this man who's spending over $100,000 to put these crosses up. Yeah, I don't know. I'm saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's, you know, I think if you draw attention to Christ and His glory to God, that's good. That's good. But, you know, there are going to be fights in communities over where those crosses should be there. And we get all upset when they take nativity scenes and crosses away, but what we need to understand is they cannot take away the influence of godly, spirit-filled people. Regardless of what they might do, Christ in you is the hope of glory. He can make the difference through you. They can take away all the nativity scenes. They can tear down all the crosses. They can take every vestige of Christianity visible that is visible out of the marketplace, but they can't take you Christ in you. Boy. Do you understand that? Folks, when we begin to get that and we begin to get up under that, we become a mighty army. The 
for the sake of Christ. I want you to understand what our enemy is trying to do. Haman, the enemy, right? Representing the enemy. And we had an enemy today as well, trying to wipe out every vestige of God, appearance of God in the marketplace. Look, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded. That means He is active. Has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Ephesians 2.2 2 says, The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Don't miss. He is actively at work. 1 Peter 5.8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Not only is he seeking those out there in the world, but he's seeking those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ to seduce us away from our calling as well. The Apostle Paul described God's call to him in this way. And I think what a great word for us. I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I am sending you. When you get up tomorrow morning, you get up on Tuesday morning, and you begin to... Uh, uh, well, somebody's calling me that phone that got lost. Okay. That's, that's, there's got to be a parable in there somewhere. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. I don't know. But anyway, uh, but, uh, what we, what we, here, here's what we, we find in the middle of all this, that God is sending us into our schools and into the marketplace. And, and we have an enemy who seeks to... Uh, to, to stand in the way of that whole process. Now, verse 8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susan for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants, servants and all and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called there is but one law to be put and that is to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live but as for me i have not been called to come into the king these 30 days now here's what's happening the, the law was set in place this is how cruel they were this is the power of the king that if you went to the king and the king was you were not in favor with the king and the king did, did not hold out his scepter to you, you could you could suffer the death penalty. But if you went to him and he held out the scepter to you, then you would be favored and you would be welcomed in. Now Esther's first thought is that you know this law, right? You know what could happen. You know what we think about when we start talking about having influence in the in marketplace. You know there are laws against speaking in the name of Jesus. You know there are laws against proselytizing. You know there are laws against evangelizing. And some of you have that, experienced that more than others in your situation. And what is our first thought? Self-preservation. I've got to preserve my job. I've got to preserve. I mean, don't you know that's how I put food on the table? Don't you know that? And what becomes? The, the, the first thing on our mind is self-preservation, right? And that's exactly what was on Esther's mind. I'm going to tell you, if you go into a foreign country as a missionary, and, and that country may have some aversion to Christianity, don't you think you're probably taking a risk? Sure you are. Why should it be any different out of our world? Don't you think there might be a risk? I'm not talking about going kicking down door stones. I'm talking about going in with the influence of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus. I'm talking about going in Holy Spirit inspired, led ways to 
bring the light of the gospel to our communities, to our places of work, even sometimes to our homes, and we might face opposition there. But look at the answer. You know, Esther says, I haven't been summoned to him in 30 days. And the king's probably not sleeping alone all those 30 days, by the way. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. And then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews for another place. But you and your father's house will perish. In other words, don't think that you're going to preserve your life by doing this, by hiding. You won't preserve your life at all. And then these amazing words, amazing words. We ought to teach these to our children. We ought to have these running around in our heads every single day. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows but that you have been put as a student in the school where you are, and, and, and in the position you're in in your workplace. Who knows that you've been given the opportunity to be the parent to that child, to that child, for such a time as this. Who knows? I think we do know, don't we? We know that God doesn't, God, God's not just playing, you know, cast the feather to the wind with our lives. There's a purpose in who we are and what we've been given and the opportunities that God has, has, has put in our, in our pathway. We have opportunity to influence. And here's the point. Embrace that influence. The influence that God has given to you. Embrace it. Seek it out. Come to understand it. You know, there are all kinds of ways we can come at culture. The different ways we can come at culture. We can run and hide from culture. That's sort of an Amish picture. And I have a lot of respect for the Amish, but I think their theology is really wrong in that sense. You know, we can conquer the culture, sort of like the moral majority, sort of failed experiment. We're going to take God. We're going to take the culture to God. You know, we're going we're to take you by the shirt collar and you're going to come to God. I think that's kind of a picture that's left out of all of that. It's sort of like giving a cat a bath, you know. Everybody gets wet, but nobody gets clean. <laughs> or you can or you can do it this way. You can merge with the culture. That's what Esther did. Esther just sort of merged. Or we can redeem the culture. You see, the difference in redeeming the culture and kind of taking, you know, conquering the culture is in conquering the culture, we're trying to take the culture to God. In redeeming the culture, we're taking God to the culture. And there's a huge difference. That's how we influence folks. You're not going to influence by taking somebody by a short collar. You don't even want to do that. But, but you can influence by walking into that workplace, that school, and rising up in your own home, in your own neighborhood every day in the Spirit of Christ, abiding in Him, walking in Him. Redeeming the culture by the life you live and the words you speak. You can make that difference. Who knows, Esther, that you've been called to this time for such a time as this. Jesus said, for whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Don't think that you can hide, Esther. You'll either find your life in serving Him or you'll lose it altogether. Now, I'm going to have to hurry here. Let me just close out what I was going to read this morning from Esther, chapter 4, verse 15 through 17. That Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susan and hold the fast on my behalf. Call the people to fasting, I believe, to prayer. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. 
No more self-preservation. No more, it's about, I might lose my life. What did Jesus say? In losing your life, you'll find your life. I don't know what repercussions might be out there in front of us as we seek to live lives that are salt and light in the world in which we live. But I think we can safely say this place. God is calling us to embrace the fact that your life is no longer your own. You don't come to Jesus Christ and just say, well, I, I'm glad to have heaven and I'm glad to, that, and I'm glad to have sort of all of the good things that are thrown in and then I'm going to go live my life the way I want to. That is not true salvation. We, it is not discipleship. Jesus said, come and follow me. Walk with me. Live with me. Live it out day in and day out. You know these words, right? Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? It's a gift. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Not simply your body in the physical sense, but you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body and the life you live every day. Now some of you are saying right now, you know what? I am up to here maybe even up to here, over capacity in my life right now. I can't give any more to anybody else. This is falling on deaf ears because I am, I am I'm overwhelmed with, with where I am right now in life. And I don't have any more to put out there. And what I want you to understand is that Jesus broadens our capacity. Jesus enlarges our capacity. You know, a few years ago, the, the, the prayer of Jabez, that whole prayer of Jabez, you remember that, increased my land and all that, and that got all kind of mixed up and abused and misused. But I'll tell you something I think that is really all about for us, and that is that God will enlarge your capacity. He will give you a capacity to do beyond what you ever thought you could do. If you will walk with Him and live with Him and abide in Him day in and day out, He said you will bear much fruit. Right? That's what we're going to be talking about these next few weeks. You will not just bear a little fruit. You will bear much fruit, more fruit, better fruit. He will enlarge your capacity. You know, there are moments in my life when I've been walking with the Lord I've been in situations where I felt like if one more straw was put on my back, I would just fold up. Ever been there? And it's in those moments that God shows Himself power. It's in those moments that God shows Himself truth. It's in those moments that God increases and enlarges my capacity as I call upon Him, as I come to Him, and I recognize my dependence upon Him. I can't. He can. We're, without me, you can do nothing. But your capacity is far greater than you've ever thought it was because His capacity is far greater than you've ever discovered. And so God is calling us, folks, to not just live common lives, or not even just to live a life, you know, kind of tucked away up in the palace so, lives that come down into the culture in which we live. And you know the amazing thing when you come down into the culture and, you, and, and, and we're scared to death that, that we'll absorb the culture and we'll become like the culture. But if you're filled with Jesus, you've got no room for the culture to fill in. And you might get a little bit on you, but He'll cleanse you through the Word. And He will give you the capacity to touch the lives around you in ways that you never imagined. If we will just open our eyes and realize that every one of us here today a call to ministry, a call to missions. I'm going to ask you to assess your influence. Whatever that may be and wherever you are right now in your life. And to look at it and realize all the ways in which you have an opportunity to touch the lives of people to influence for the kingdom of God and be filled with the Spirit of God. Abide in Christ and let Him raise you up to do amazing things 
And you never even imagine by His Spirit and by His working in your life.